our webinar uh, and we're going to be looking at the best ways to design a quality scorecard. Delighted to welcome two speakers uh, to our webinar program. One who's attended, who's done a number of webinars for us before and uh, also a new speaker. So uh, Martin uh, Jukes is a consultant with uh, Empathy, uh, Empathy Plus. Martin, you, you've uh, been consulting in a whole range of different uh, uh, different uh, uh, contact centres. Yes, I have a, a range from um, some with three seats. So I did work some with, with one organisation with three seats for a global contact centre uh, up to 25,000 seats. So uh, a broad range of sales and service and alarm monitoring and a whole variety. Wonderful. It's a, it's a very uh, fascinating area, the whole contact centre. Yes. It's one that you, uh, I find you get into and you can't ever can't ever leave like Hotel California. Don't want to um, leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. And uh, too, too much good fun. And also delighted to welcome to his first webinar with us, uh, Reg Dutton from uh, Evaluation. And uh, Reg, you're going to be uh, looking at the whole way of building a, a quality scorecard. And in particular, one of the things that uh, uh, I think is going to be very popular is looking at calibration. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. I think more specifically as well um, with regards to, to agents and how you can get agents involved in calibration um, and how that can support agent engagement and uh, help to move things forward that way. Wonderful. And if you want to meet Reg in real life, the great opportunity to do that is at the Future of Quality Assurance Conference that is in 28th of uh, February in London, England. And um, there's a, a complimentary or free ticket available for all call center helper uh, readers. So if you go to the, uh, the details there. Um, if you want to watch a replay of the webinar, uh, that will be available later on this afternoon, callcenterhelper.com recorded webinars from about an hour after the webinar is finished. We're having the uh, chat uh, today in our chat room. And uh, here is the address here, callcenter.helper. Uh, uh, dot com forward slash uh, chat and uh, you just type that into a browser uh, have one on one screen the chat room on one screen the uh, webinar slides on the other screen and then you can see them they're not integrated but most people with screens are big enough you can see the two happening at the same time added advantage of being in the chat room is that you can get hold of the webinar slides and uh, just once you're logged in uh, put in your name, address, and email, and then the uh, download webinar slides button on the right-hand side, you can download the slides uh, from there. Added advantage of being in the, in the chat room is that you can ask questions of our panelists and of the rest of the answer uh, of the audience. And if you've got an answer, you can answer those, or you can have a discussion with other people in the audience. And, or if you use hashtag tip for a tip, and there is a bottle of uh, champagne. This is a rather nice uh, Tashan G uh, Brew Reserve. Um, or if you prefer a box of chocolates or an Amazon gift card, we can ship that off uh, to you instead. So we're going to start off uh, with a poll. The poll is in the uh, uh, window in, uh, in the webinar software. And that poll is, when did your company last change the questions on your quality scorecard? Was it in the past week? Was it in the past month? Was it in the past year? Was it in the past five years? Or has it never been, uh, never been changed? Uh, Reg, any any answer you think is going to come out uh, high on here? Um, um, oh, difficult to say. I suspect probably um, the past year may well come up quite a lot if I had to stick my neck on the line, um, but uh, we'll wait and see, I think. Okay, well, uh, just close the results here. You should be able to see those on your screen. Uh, sample size of 209, which is a very good sample size, and 7% uh, in the past week, 22% in the past month, uh, but the over overall majority there, 44% in the past year, 19% in the past five years, and 8% have never changed the uh, uh, the questions on there. So I guess if there's one uh, key takeaway, that would probably be the uh, uh, would be one of the ones to uh, one of the ones to do. So just uh, uh, doing that, I think everyone saw the uh, everyone saw the results on the screen 
there. So um, yeah, some uh, some real big uh, food for thought uh, on that, and that's probably quite a good uh, 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 time to hand the baton across to uh, Martin Jukes. And Martin, perhaps if you'd like to uh, take us through your thoughts of uh, how to improve uh, or how to design a, a quality scorecard. Yes, thank you, John T. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks again for, for inviting me here today, John T. To uh, to uh, present and uh, be able to share my views on, on, on the world or part of the world. Um, there. So I want to talk to you about uh, my views on the best way to design a, a quality scorecard and start by looking at what are the considerations? What should you think about when, when designing? Well, first of all is why are you looking to measure quality? Secondly, what should be measured? How do we do it? And then when should we measure it? So fairly simple, simple questions. Um, so first starting off is why should we have a quality scorecard? And this is a question that's, that's, that I ask people when they ask if we can help them in, in develop, developing a quality scorecard is, is what's your purpose? What are you really looking to do? And you can see a number of uh, different answers that we receive there on, on, on the screen, ranging from measuring advice performance, reporting as a KPI. So some people only measure because they have to report as a KPI. The most popular and, and perhaps most forward thinking is uh, to change advisor behavior and using the data to be able to do that. But there are others in terms of motivating the team, checking up on our agents. So there's a whole wide range of, uh, of, of answers to this solution. I'm just showing here a slide that I used in a previous webinar and the, the, the subject matter there was improving agent performance. And I talked about how it was important to, to measure performance, to share information and then to take action. What I've highlighted here is um, is in in the red circles or the red uh, o, uh, shapes is is that a number of the areas that I've focused on then are very very relevant to managing quality. So we look at measuring. So we're measuring through quality scorecards, identifying trends. We're looking at how we can share the information and communicate performance both to individuals and teams, and then most importantly, how we can act, how we can intervene and make use of the data and develop improvement plans. So this isn't really a standalone subject. It's all very, very fundamental towards ensuring uh, and improving agent performance and maximizing, maximizing uh, output. One of the frequent questions that we do get asked is, can we just download? Can we download um, from the internet? Well, I had a look uh, and went through Google and I put in uh, CRQM for call recording quality monitoring and within just over half a second I had 239 million results. So it's quite staggering uh, looking at the number of, uh, of, of articles and features that there are in, in uh, available. And that leads to the next question which is really, well if there are that many, which one should I use? Which one is the best for, 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 for me and my organization? And again, when we start to look at this in a little bit more detail, um, I think uh, John T asked me a question earlier about the different types of organizations that I've worked in. Working in sales environments is completely different to working in a service environment and hence you need to measure different things. You have inbound centers and outbound centers and again measure different measures for different purposes. So it's really important to try and focus on what's right for your organization and particularly focusing on what are the objectives of measuring quality to make sure that your scorecard does measure those things. So what is the customer service strategy? What are you aiming to deliver? Do you have compliance issues that you have to make sure are included in, in the conversation? Are you trying to follow a process? Are you looking to measure the customer experience or empathy? Or is it the, adverse, the opposite of that in terms of being a hard sell? Finally, remembering that individual requirements are needed to meet individual organizations' needs. And I can't emphasize enough how different uh, each organization is in the way it operates and the, the, deliver, the way it delivers services. So to develop something bespoke for yourself. Moving on to channels, well, call recording quality management has traditionally had a, a focus on, on telephone calls, as it says. We've got a tool that we use called Evaluate that does a comparison across different channels um, and looks at them in, 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 in uh, isolation, but also in comparison across the, the range of channels. And we find that when we look at quality, really, there's not a lot of quality measurement that's done outside of telephones. So there's an enormous gap there. We can see from customers' perspectives, we use a whole wide range of different channels. And this is some data that I picked up from, uh, from recent work uh, by Nice in Contact. And we can see that these, as well as telephone, 
we've got email, chat, and a whole wide range of others from text, social media, etc. One of the other interesting points on this slide is, um, yes, we're looking to measure quality from the advisor and agent perspective, but there are also some channels now emerging or being used, such as websites, um, mobile apps, automated menus, and other automated solutions that don't actually use an agent. There's no agent involvement in, in those uh, channels. And it's really important that we actually focus and say, what is the quality like on those channels rather than just focusing solely on the agents? The other interesting aspect about the different channels is the different rules of engagement and different levels of, uh, of acceptability across those different channels. So the type of conversation in social media may well be slightly different or it is different to the, what you'd expect to see in email. Uh, and it's really important that you, you sort of reflect those in the, in the questions that you ask and the, the scoring assessment that you make uh, of performance of quality. So what to measure? What's the most important and relevant things to measure? Well, a whole wide range of measures, a whole wide range of measures. Uh, some are objective, some are subjective. Um, for many organizations, quality is the main KPI for customer service. So it's interesting listening to some of the questions, or some of the things raised earlier, points raised earlier, um, around how um, measuring quality doesn't necessarily fit with other KPIs. From my perspective, I think quality is one of the most important things in terms of giving that level of service that then starts to improve overall pay, uh, KPI performance. The sort of areas that I would look to, to include in terms of developing a scorecard is what's important to the customer? Uh, is it the customer experience? What's the experience like? Is the customer receiving their outcome or the outcome that they, they anticipated receiving or hope to receive? From the organization's perspective, you can measure whether you're meeting the regulatory needs, whether you're delivering against your strategic objectives, are you in enforcing policy, um, matching policy, and are you adhering to scripted areas that need to be measured with some sort of accuracy? And then the final area is about engagement. So really having a look from a more subjective perspective around behaviors, attitudes and the approach of the advisor in helping that customer to deliver their objectives. We look at scoring, we often get asked about which is the best way to score, you know, which is the best model. Well, there's a whole wide range of scoring uh, to, to meet questions. Some of the questions are objective, some of them are subjective. So for objective scoring, you know, it's quite easy to say yes or no. Uh, so did the advisor use their name in, during the call? Well, either they did or they didn't. So that's quite easy to say uh, to score. We then move into an area where there's a little bit more softer things. So we start looking at um, uh, an area that may have a middle ground. So a red, amber, green indicator. So yes, they definitely did. No, they definitely didn't. But maybe there's a little bit in the middle where they bit bits and pieces. So we'd use that indicator there. And then finally, over the subjective scale, how, how engaging was that uh, was the advisor with the customer? So that's really subjective and left to the uh, the, the assessment or the assessors to, to to determine where they are on that sliding scale. I've used a scale there of of, of zero to ten, and the scale is flexible to use uh, for people to put in what they want. So the question that we asked is is that we get asked is which is the best method of scoring? I believe that the best is probably one of a, a combination. So there would be some things that are quite binary and you can say yes or no. Whereas there are other things at the other end of the scale that do need to have uh, more subjective um, work involved in them. And Martin, now is probably a good time to, uh, uh, to run a poll on this, uh, which, we, um, uh, which we have. And uh, what we'd be interested to uh, know is um, how do you present your agent quality scores? Do you do it as a number score, such as uh, 16 out of 20? Do you do it as a percentage score, for instance, 63%? Do you do it as a pass-fail uh, system? Do you do it as a banding, for instance, uh, red, amber, green? Or do you have some sort of combination or different, uh, different uh, way of uh, doing the score? So if you'd just like to uh, vote uh, on that, uh, do you have a number score, a percentage score, a pass-fail system, a banding system, such as red, iron, the green, or do you have a blended or combined score? And if you've got a blended or combined score, perhaps if you could um, uh, put a little bit in the chat room about how that uh, how that works. I'm just going to share this uh, with everyone 
now, and um, we have a sample size of 243 on here. And it looks like, uh, Martin, the overwhelming majority here use a percentage scoring system, 63%, mm. followed by a number score. 25% uh, use a very, um, uh, use some form of blended or combined score. It'd be interesting to see how that combined score works. 4% um, have a pass or fail. And I'm quite surprised that the red, amber, green, um, which I've seen working very, very effectively in a number of organizations, uh, only 5% only of people are using that. Yes, that's interesting information. Um, I'm a little bit surprised at some of those some of those outputs as well. So it is uh, yes, very interesting. Okay, so anyway, back back to you, Martin. Okay, thank you. Um, the interesting thing with those results is is actually looking at them and, and how they compare to individual organisations. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to also move on to with regards to the, uh, the the various questions is that making the point that not all topics measured have equal values. So it's important to sort of give some scores uh, a higher factor or a factor rating. So, uh, or give some questions a higher rating than others because they're a little bit more important than others. So it's about getting that whole balance um, and bringing it together so that you can present a, a, final, a final score of some sort. It's also interesting when we start looking at areas that aren't applicable or aren't appropriate. So um, I'm, I'm sort of quite keen in talking about appropriateness when it comes to empathy. And I do believe that not every measure is applicable or appropriate to every contact. So not applicable is actually a valid answer in some cases. And what I'm talking about there is having a, a, a final question or a final score that says it's not appropriate. So we can then exclude that from any final results. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a couple of examples uh, where, I, where I see this being particularly relevant, people using inappropriate rules. So um, I might ring an organization and I say, right, I want to speak to my, uh, my uh, account manager of that particular organization. I know who I've rung, but there'll be a rule that says that I have to name the organization three times during the conversation. Uh, and it's not actually always, always appropriate. The other thing that happened to me fairly recently is um, asking me irrelevant questions. So I, I was closing an account with an organization. I wasn't particularly satisfied with the service they'd offered or provided to me. So I wanted to close the account and I, I did make it quite clear, you know, I won't be coming back to you at all. And the final question, the call was, uh, is there anything else I can help you with? And it was obviously uh, completely irrelevant to me and should have showed a real disregard for what I was saying. So having uh, something that's not appropriate, not applicable is quite important. Because, of course, a good contact should be relevant and personalised. So it doesn't matter if it doesn't tick every box. And the other thing, we're having a scorecard that does push people and drive behaviour to do things like that. It starts to kill empowerment and the, the opportunity for advisors to be um, really uh, solution providers. The next thing about uh, developing the scorecard is, is having something that's usability, it's, you, has a high level of usability. So it's very easy to complicate. When we start looking at how to measure, we start looking at some uh, people using a manual process, other people have systems, some people use all recordings, whether it's email, telephone call, chats or whatever, whereas others do live monitoring. So when you start to get that balance, you can start to see uh, how there'd the, be uh, uh, different purposes for, for each of those. Um, you need to make sure that when you're developing something, it's easy to record the information and and to be able to share it and share it in a, in a matter that people can uh, see easily. I've given an example there at the bottom of where of a question that uh, that I saw once that sort of went through a number of different parts of a question to be able to give a final score that eventually becomes so complex that it's not necessarily worth getting to that uh, that position. The important thing I think, particularly when it comes to subjectivity, is did it feel right? Did the conversation sound right? Did it feel right from a customer's point of view, as well as did it feel right from the advisor's perspective? When it comes to using the data, and I, again, going back to the very, uh, the, the very first slide I put on it, sort of talked about uh, feedback in one-to-ones. In That's the most important thing that, uh, that uh, advisors really receive is, is that good quality feedback. And using that through the one-to-ones to identify training needs um, for individuals and for the team uh, and having a, a review of the overall performance uh, wherever possible. 
So to present a positive and negative findings through that feedback process, rather than just focusing on the, on the negative, which often happens. And then moving on to just identifying the trends and making sure that there is uh, an individual tracking, but also a team tracking to make sure that um, we can see the behavioral change, trends that are taking place. It's easy to fix um, poor trends through reinforcement, but really getting to the point of what is the, the real cause of behavioral change is what will really make the difference longer term to the organizations of quality performance. How much and how often? Again, frequent questions that we get asked. Uh, it needs to be sufficient, the quality management needs to be sufficient to enable performance and quality management of, to be realistic and, and, and useful, but not so much that it becomes onerous. There are a wide range of factors that contribute towards um, the, the, the frequency and how complex it needs to be, the types of measurement involved, the range of services, the range of channels, the purpose of the, uh, the, the, the quality scorecarding, but also the scale of the organization. So for some organizations that have a dedicated quality manager who, whose full-time role was to, to, to manage this quality measurement process, others it might well be a team leader that's trying to fit this in alongside their return to work and their motivation and, and a whole wide range of other activities. So we can't necessarily say that they, they're going to be able to as many as, as a dedicated person. You can flex, you can increase in size um, as, as much as you want, but I certainly recommend at least doing a monthly measure for each team member to make sure that they're, they're, they're kept on track and valid all throughout the, the, the whole of their um, working career. Some of the other points that were raised are quite interesting, were around, uh, which I didn't expect to see the, the comments and the feedback, were around uh, implementation and getting good buy-in from uh, both advisor and team leaders. So I've, I've sort of put a couple of things in, into a couple of suggestions in here. I think it's really important to communicate the purpose and the benefits of quality monitoring before starting. I think it's essential that you share the model and the questions with anticipated or expected answers so that team members understand exactly what they're doing throughout the process uh, and, and can get involved and support it. And finally, to involve advisors in developing the scorecard and the process means that we'll have a much better buy-in because they're part of it and that they'll start to, 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 to believe in it and support it. So to summarize, think about your specific requirements for your specific organization. I think that's really, really important rather than just trying to, to do the same as somebody else, uh, a neighboring organization. Measure quality across all channels, but modify those questions to make sure they're relevant to that particular channel. Ensure the flexibility and have not applicable as an option. So make sure that what you're measuring is accurate um, and, and can adapt to meet your requirements. One size doesn't fit all. So again, going back to the free, previous earlier point, make sure it's right for your organization and use the data. Um, for so many organizations I see, they collect lots and lots of data and they simply report on it. They don't do anything of real value in terms of using that data to improve. Thank you. Thanks for listening. You're on mute. Thank you very much for that, Martin, and uh, some great, uh, uh, great uh, thoughts there. Um, some very interesting feedback. We're going to jump across to the uh, chat room where we've had some uh, very interesting feedback from uh, people about the scoring uh, mechanisms. Uh, particularly people who used a, a blended score. So Annette has said we have a blended score percentage that is shown as a red, amber, green or purple. Uh, I'd be interested to know what goes into the purple category there, Annette, so perhaps if you'd like to drop that into the chat room. Uh, Emma says we have a percentage score for the customer service side of the quality score and a pass fail for the regulatory side, so that's quite a nice blended approach. Uh, Sharon says we use a blended for the PBM call center, things uh, such as HIPAA, which uh, in the US is the Health Insurance Portability Accounting Act, which sounds like a, a bit of a mouthful, that is a pass or fail. The rest are a sliding, uh, sliding score of one to five. And uh, also Karen says, uh, we also use blended scoring. We use a combination of critical needs improvement, satisfactory, not applicable. This generates a red, amber, green status that equates to a percentage score. So Martin, there's uh, quite a range in that in that blended category. Yeah, some some good feedback there. Some some good ideas and good um, 
uh, examples of where people have developed what's important for them. Yeah, I think the uh, that compliance one is quite uh, is quite yeah. critical. It, you know, almost being as a separate as a separate metric, which is uh, sort of very different from uh, um, you know one of the, the critical ones if you're in a compliance in, uh, environment. So yeah. let's have a look. Uh, we've got a question from Liam. Liam says we've re recently introduced self uh, scoring for agents on a monthly basis, three contacts each. I'm undecided on how effective this process is and feel there is some fine tuning to do to make it really work. How does everyone feel about this process? Any suggestions for getting the most out of uh, agent self-scoring? Rich, have you got any opinions on this one? Um, I think I think if you've got that culture in place where, you know, where agents are effectively clued up on coaching and they've had good understanding of of what's involved and you know they're engaged with that I think you know it, it can certainly be a good idea and I think you know especially where agents are scoring their own contacts in those scenarios calibration as important as it, as it is anyway you know I think you know there should be more emphasis placed on that to, to support that process that you're going through. Uh, and Martin, I think this comes down to what you're what you're trying to achieve because I think agent self-scoring is particularly useful for behavioural change. Uh, I guess the the downside with agent self-scoring is we all score ourselves as uh, excellent, um, but highlighting some areas that need improvement. I I think that it's quite interesting to then start to look at trends for individual agents. So if if it's if we do have a uh, some agents that let's say are a little bit more positive in their uh, opinions of the, their performance than others, then uh, we'd start to see trends. Um, they set a baseline for, for their own performance, I suppose, through that trends. But it's, it's, it's really quite interesting. And it goes back to that whole calibration issue uh, of, of how do we make sure one is compared with, or an apple is compared with an apple, and those sorts of things. And if anyone's got any ideas on, on that, if they'd like to jot in the chat room. Uh, Annette says red is unacceptable up to 75%. Amber is work to do. Green is achieving. And purple is amazing. So uh, um, I wonder why uh, uh, why purple that um, might be tied into the uh, tied into the brand. Um, yes. Tom says we review the agent recorded uh, calls together and review. The agent also gives feedback and recognizes where improvement is needed to deliver the ultimate customer. Uh, experience certainly I, I think where the advisor gives feedback and represents uh, um, you know is uh, it, it can be very very uh, powerful um, it's sort of more mm. like show rather than tell I like Kristen says uh, we're now working on a survey uh, out to our agents this has been about six months with the new scorecard so we can get feedback on how they like it and uh, uh, and what changes necessary. I, I think, uh, Rich, that's quite a nice one of um, sending out a survey. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think yeah, throughout throughout any quality process, um, whether it's surveying or getting agents together, absolutely, you know, believe in that 100% from an engagement point of view, absolutely. Well, here's a question that ties down to uh, advisor buy-in. How can we make sure that agency quality scorecards is a chance to improve and not fear to be published, uh, put, sorry, punished for doing something, uh, uh, something wrong. So that's an interesting one, Martin. Any uh, uh, any thoughts? I think it, uh, Reg talked a little bit earlier around culture, and I think it's having a culture that that supports that. Um, and and I suppose it, it 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 develops with time to start with, because if if punishment has been in place previously for doing something wrong, then um, it's it's hard to move away from that that idea that's going to happen to you again so i really think it's about engaging with the agents and uh, and helping them to see that they're not going to be punished and there is something positive through uh, through that improvement mm -hmm. I, I have seen some schemes where we've uh, where we've seen um reward for improvement in performance rather than simply best performance yeah and i think things like league tables are one of the ones that call centers love league tables but that they're it's uh, it's very subtle. Um, that can also be seen as very punishing. If it's league yeah. tables are great if you're top of the table, uh, but if you're anywhere sort of in the bottom half, can actually be seen as as punishing. So maybe maybe not uh, using them as league tables, not having them visible on notice boards 
mm. or things like that um, is quite a key one. Right, a couple yes. more tips. Uh, Andy says, uh, here's a tip. We built what we felt was best for the customer journey, then asked all our team leaders to go and use it and come back to us with feedback so we could adapt it to be the best version of what we have and be functional, which I think is a nice, uh, nice tip. Uh, Dawn says, we offer our customers the option to complete a two-question survey at the end of the call where they rate the customer experience and how well the agent performed. This is on top of the individual KPIs. If a supervisor, I review the satisfaction, as a, sorry, as a supervisor, I review the satisfaction surveys and if it is a fair review of the agent. I certainly think it's a great, uh, uh, great idea to get uh, a feedback mm. loop from the customer. And uh, finally, in this section, Brittany says, calibrate with agents as well as management. You can use previous calls from other call centers uh, or agents uh, that are no longer employed. And uh, Rich, I think you're going to be talking uh, in uh, calibration in just a, a very short moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm sure I'll cover that point. OK, brilliant. Well, we're going to uh, jump across and we're going to do a uh, poll. Uh, before we do that, uh, before we jump across, Reg will be carrying out a poll. And the poll is what technology to use for your uh, quality uh, for your quality scoring. Um, so just like to uh, do it, you can select all that apply here. Is it pen and paper? Do you use spreadsheets? Do you use quality monitoring software? Do you use online scorecards? Or do you have some automated scoring or speech analytics systems? So just uh, click on the uh, on the results here. Reg, I'm expecting probably spreadsheets are going to be quite uh, quite popular. Yeah, I'd, I'd expect that as well. Um, so yeah, over the years and with you know clients that we work with, historically spreadsheets. Is, I mean, to be honest, it's because spreadsheets is always the the easiest place to start, um, especially for smaller contact centres. So yeah, I would expect that to be the most common. And indeed, it is. 58% uh, of the audience are using spreadsheets, 40% using quality monitoring software, 26%, which is a growing uh, arrangement now, are using online scorecards. I guess, you know, spreadsheets fall down in that they're very individual. 11% uh, still using uh, pen and paper. It uh, can be quite a, a good way when you're doing side-by-side -side reviews. And 7% uh, are using an automated scoring or speech analytics system. So that's uh, starting to uh, starting to grow overall so um uh, we're now just going to jump across to uh, uh across across to uh, reg so uh, i will just uh transfer the presentation to reg and uh, reg if you'd like to uh, put the slides up on your screen and uh, take us through your thoughts across to you okay brilliant thank you very much um great okay so um yep yeah. I'm going to cover for the next uh, 12 minutes or so um, how to use quality to engage your agents and then the power of agent calibration as well in supporting agent engagement. But firstly, um, I just want to briefly look at um, what you know agents have say about quality and their perceptions of quality based on you know my experience and you know businesses that, that we've worked with previously. Um, and, you know, these are really the things that agents will will say, uh, or you might hear them say when, you know, potentially they're, they're not engaged in quality. And the big thing, you know, a big one of this is that agents often feel that quality is something that's done to them. Um, it's, you know, they're, at, you know, they're at the front line, they're speaking to customer after customer, and then in the background, someone's doing quality to them. Um, you know, whether it's they think that the evaluator's picking all of the worst calls intentionally and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, but they don't really feel that um, it's something that they have as much of a, a a role to play is actually they really can do. They don't really understand uh, often as well the value that quality has to the organisation, um, and you know makes them you know feel what's the what's the point, um, you know, and particularly if they feel that they're not getting right things right all of the time, or you know things aren't going particularly well for them that often, they can start to question the value of it um, and really where that's taking them in terms of their own performance. And then them and us. Uh, so really, often this comes up 
with a, between agents and evaluators now whether that's a separate coaching uh, quality team rather or evaluators in general um, I found that pr there's often um, a, a gap there between between the two sides so there's this invisible barrier that the the agents are on one side and then the evaluators are on the other side and there's n often not a link there between the two where you know they can talk to each other interact with each other uh, and talk about quality together and as a result agents often feel that they don't feel that their view is important um, they feel that they get their results they get the the feedback or the commentary on the scorecards of that, those evaluations and that that's where it stops um, and you know they kind of have to bite down on that and accept that that's the result and you know keep moving forward and you know when you do have low engagement the details that sit within the, the scorecards and within that evaluation feedback becomes less relevant to the agent, becomes less important. Um, and particularly where everything's purely based around that final outcome score is that an agent will just go into open up that evaluation or the minute they receiving the feedback value about that evaluation, all they'll want to know is have they passed? That's all they want to know. Is it a pass? Am I, am I safe so far this month for, the, for my result and uh, my KPI score at the end of the month? So how can you use quality um, to engage agents and help to combat some of these feelings and perceptions that they may have about quality? So first of all, um, and again, just elaborate a little bit further on, on something that Martin covered in his presentation is involving agents in your in the design of your quality scorecards and indeed I'd take it a step further than that that not just the scorecard design but if you're designing a new quality framework or redesigning a framework um, then again get agents involved as early as possible but in the case of scorecards, you know, you can do this in a number of different ways. You can have agent forums where you can get, perhaps get a select number of um, agent champions. The agents represent each, uh, a number of different teams that they can collate, you know, various pieces of feedback from those agents that they can take through. Or alternatively, you can gather this information from your agents uh, from, a, from across the different teams. Um, the important thing to remember is here when you're going through this process is agents are at the front line agents are speaking to your customers every single day for a number of different queries issues complaints you know all of these different things and they're they're living these experiences with these customers every single day so to me it just makes common sense that you know if you are looking at designing a new quality scorecard or redesigning it then their input you know is, is you know invaluable to you in order to get the information from an agent to understand you know what they feel um, are important um, things to customers that they care about that they should be measured on and the kind Absolutely. of we, we had a, a couple of tips along that line I think I thought tied in very nicely mm -hmm. about uh, either doing a survey or getting team leaders to try it and and asking for agent feedback so I think that ties in very nicely absolutely yeah and again you know if we, we've talked about culture a couple of times as well but it's it's this starting point if you like um, which you know starts to breed that culture and that confidence around quality and that actually you know we can, agents themselves can make a difference and have an input but also as well you know once you've got them involved of course don't just leave it there it's important to follow up on all of that information that you've collected and whether it's a forum or done through meetings um, however that may be you know set clear guidelines and expectations to your agents about how you're going to come back to them um, you know to, to feedback how you've used that information what information you've used why if you've not used anything you know explain that as well you know again if you want them to be engaged and you want them to feel like they're involved it's important to get that bit right as well so you know once you have created your scorecard and you've got those scorecards in place it's important to make sure that the data that you're giving to your agents about those scorecards and about their results you know is relevant to what they need 
if you don't want them to focus solely on a overall score, then perhaps just giving them an overall score isn't necessarily the the the, the optimal way to proceed in terms of giving them the data. You know, perhaps give them um, their own agent dashboards, perhaps, or as well as giving them their evaluation summary, give them a breakdown of those line items and those questions within the scorecard about how they've scored and perhaps present them in a way that, you know, they can trend that performance for themselves over time. And this is something that the evaluation software, you know, provides for agents because you want agents ultimately to be able to use that information um, you know it's great as Martin said lots of contact centers produce lots of data from quality but often it doesn't get used in the right way and if you want agents to be engaged with it then make sure that you're giving them what they need to be fully engaged with their own individual performance so as well as the data, when you're designing your quality scorecards, think about the tools that an agent requires in order to succeed and give them every chance for success with the, those different measures that you include in your scorecard. You know, I mean, agents will be very quick to tell you if there's something in the scorecard that is a challenge to them because perhaps they don't have the right systems or something is ineffective in enabling them to be able to service a customer optimally in a particular area so we'll con also consider that as well when you're designing your scorecards if you're measuring if you're measure going to measure something does the agent have everything that they need at their disposal to be able to succeed in that particular measure and also take a balanced approach approach to feedback when you're evaluating with your agents as well so it's very easy and it is very common that when an agent has done something either incorrectly or there's something that's not quite hit the mark, it's very easy to write up a, a detailed commentary around what it was that they didn't do, why it wasn't effective, what they can do different next time. But at the same time, you know, although this is good information for an agent, over a, a period of time, if this is the only detailed commentary or feedback that they're receiving from their evaluations, then you've got to start questioning how that's going to affect their engagement with regards to quality. Um, it's easier in many ways to write up about the things that they, they did incorrectly. But, you know, when you're doing that, just think about when you're listening to those contacts, when you're looking at a contact to be sure to be pulling out all of those great things that they've done. So when you're giving that feedback, not only are you, you know, giving some detailed feedback around, you know, where the coaching opportunities are, but also around where those successes are. What do they need to keep on doing to make sure that what, you know, that area of performance that they are excelling in continues with every customer. And so the agent is aware of that. And encourage the sharing of best practice. So, again, this is something, you know, again, in my experience, which doesn't happen that often amongst agents and peer to peers between agents. You know, you'll find within your within your businesses and organizations that you'll have agents out there that, are, you know, are knocking it out the park left, right and center or indeed that people have come from somewhere where they've really struggled for a period of time, but now they've started to improve, they've started to make some changes, and things are really starting to, you know, go on the up for them as well. So, you know, how have they done that? You know, how can they share that with their colleagues? So, you know, if someone has struggled and they're improving, I guarantee that there's going to be other agents within that, you know, within that team or that business that are in exactly that same position. And it's talking to the peers that can really make a difference. It's somebody else that has been in their shoes, in their exact position, you know, whether it be they've been performance managed on it or something else, then, you know, get them talking to each other and make time for them to share best practice. And finally, um, get your agents calibrating. So this is something that I'm going to move on to, as John has been saying, in more detail. But this, for me, is a, is a key part of um, getting your agents engaged in quality. So I'm just going to talk now about the value of that. So we're all aware of, 
of um, calibration and the importance it has in terms of you know gaining consistency and checking consistency um, across your evaluators, your quality teams, coaches, team managers who are either evaluating themselves or responsible for delivering the feedback on those evaluations that come through. But what about agents? You know. Do you use agents in calibration sessions? And if so, think about how you're doing that. And there's a number of different ways that you can do this. The simplest way, first of all, is getting some agents together and holding a calibration session with just agents in there. You know, get a mixture of agents of different performance levels. You know, so you've got you are going to have differences between those consistencies that are going to drive those conversations and get people talking about quality. But also, you know, it is all inclusive. You know, you don't want that them and us feeling between agents and evaluators. So mix that up in the room. Get your agents in the room with some of the evaluators. And again, it's that information that those agents have that feed in to, you know, through that calibration process, their ideas and perceptions and, and thoughts around quality and how customers should be treated that, you know, can support evaluators. And, you know, if you are struggling um, in calibration sessions, in finding consistency, then, you know, agents, you know, can have some great ideas that can help perhaps tighten up those quality guidelines to help you move forward and, and you know, and, and get that a little straighter. So, once you're doing that and your agents are calibrating, what it will start to do is start improving agents' appreciation and understanding of quality. So agents will start to look at quality in a different way. They'll take a more rounded view of quality and start to understand the more of the intricacies about what's, what the expected standards are. And you know, it should start to help make them start reflecting on previous efforts and how they can make changes and make a difference moving forward. And of course, when they're thinking that way, you know, you're em empowering them uh, to take more ownership of their own quality performance, take a lead in quality, um, recognizing perhaps the support opportunities that, that, that they identify through quality and just generally get them talking about it a lot more. You know, they'll be easier, they'll then be easier to recognize and start to see the changes, um, perhaps that weren't as clear to them previously before they were calibrating, that they can then start to take action. And of course, then their opinion starts to count. And then in turn, what you will then find is that when it comes to coaching conversations or one-to-one -one meetings, annual performance reviews, quarterly appraisals, all of that good stuff, your agents have got everything that they need to lead those conversations more rather than being reliant on a coach or a manager to effectively tell them how they've been performing over a previous period of time and where it is that they need to improve, your agents will be able to actively talk about this uh, and raise these things themselves during those conversations. And it becomes more of that kind of conversation rather than the agent just defending a position or a particular result. So I hope that helps. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about us, you can visit our website. Look, uh, you can get started for free on our software. Um, it includes a, a, a library of free scorecards, uh, and we'll be happy to, to support you and, and start working with you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, for that there, Rich. And um, you know some great uh, uh, some great thoughts there. So uh, if you'd like to see a demonstration of the uh, evaluate agent uh, uh, solution for uh, quality, if you just like to uh, uh, tick on the box now, and uh, we'll arrange for uh, uh, pass that on to Reg to uh, arrange that for you. We're just going to uh, jump across now to the uh, chat room and. Um, uh, we'll have a look at what some of the top tips and uh, questions uh, have come through. So uh, Lorraine says uh, we arrange for all start all new starters to spend time with quality as part of their induction. They understand the process from the start, and it becomes very normal. So I guess that's a way of setting expectations uh, as we go through. Uh, Pierce has said um, communicate, collaborate, uh, collaborate, and calibrate the three C's are very important. Communicate with all parties involved, 
and ensure that everyone knows what is expected of them, collaborate with each other to get better by communicating expectations. Lastly, uh, calibration is equally, if, uh, if not most important. Collaborate with all parties involved and help with delivery. It gets everyone on the same page. Reg, well, calibration, I think, was uh, the message you were taking away. and looks like uh, uh, Pierce there has uh, that all, all tied in very nicely. Great. Thank you, Pierce. Yeah, great. So uh, let's have a, uh, a look at a few more. James says, create two scoring systems, soft skill and compliance or regulations. That way, if they fail on their compliance or uh, regulation requirements, you can still praise soft skill. It's a, uh, quite a nice way of splitting, uh, splitting the two. And he says, we have two fields in our analysis that requires the evaluator to put uh, a development note and a positive note. This way, the evaluator is recognizing the good work they've done uh, to combat the perceived negative feeling. Martin, I, I, I quite like that. It's, it's, mm. It can often be seen as a way of beating, beating up advisors. You know, I often hear, you know, I take, you know, 85 calls a day and you've picked three examples just about to, to beat me up on. Yeah, so I like the, uh, well, I like the term development um, rather than uh, just simply uh, a negative. Uh, for, for starters, but uh, I think it's really important that there's some um, commentary provided as well as just a number. Um, and I didn't really talk about that as much uh, in, in, in the presentation. I talked more about scoring, but I think the commentary is really helpful. Indeed. Um, so uh, Marco said, how do you compare the results of CSAP with the quality scores co collected by your, uh, your QA staff? Uh, I don't know, Reg. Have you got any any feelings on how you you you, you compare the two? Um, it can uh, it can be difficult, I think, to to compare CSAT results with quality scores. Um, I think you know, I think with a with a quality score internally, you tend to have a, a broader spectrum that you're looking at when you're putting that scorecard together. Whereas a customer will generally, when they Call up, call, call up a business. They'll have a specific goal in mind with an aim of what they expect. And regardless sometimes of whether the agent has absolutely done everything right and serviced that customer well, it doesn't always account for customer expectation. Mm. So I think it's great to compare the two, but I'd proceed with caution in that area, mm. is my opinion. Yeah, maybe an area where trends perhaps uh, comes in. Um, Stuart says we've uh, uh, we've trialled had, having a separate quality team, uh, independent view and consistent feedback. However, the financial cost of this was seen as a burden. Uh, we're now trialling live, a mixture of side by side and remote monitoring, uh, recorded and group monitoring. Uh, the group monitoring being a calibration uh, meeting, which is bringing out some very varied results and ideas. Martin, what's your thought on that? Uh, it's interesting how it's seen as a as a financial cost um, measuring quality. That, that that sort of almost assumes that uh, that quality is is not uh, necessarily regarded as being that important. Um, I think there's lots of different. One of the things that's come out through today's webinar is the wide variety in the way that quality is measured and how it's used and uh, and seen to be useful by different organizations uh, I, I think uh, for, for Stuart I would say keep going with it seeing how you get on um, you'd hope that the various results start to uh, come together over time and we start to see a little bit more consistency um, but it's probably um, something to keep going and keep learning about how to do it better yourselves and I think one of the other key, key things I've seen is the what is the role of the team of the team manager there because often mm. I see team managers almost take their role as answering email as one of the key uh, the key things and don't mm. really necessarily see coaching as probably the most important thing that they can mm. they can do and maybe that some of the stuff is not so much about financial cost as but as, as about shouldn't that be what the team managers are doing mm. and maybe the team managers haven't been trained or, or 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 coached in what they should be doing and where they should be spending their time yes yeah, so i definitely think coaching is the most important role for a manager or a team leader and and would give the most benefit um i think it's not always easy to do without the the the, the skills or the experience or the training to be able to do it 
So I would definitely suggest that uh, that's a, a big area to, to focus on. Having the data is one thing, but being able to, to talk and coach and use that data is, is, is a, a different matter altogether. So Matt asked the question, would you suggest a scorecard that scores every section equally, or would you handicap certain sections to count for more? If it's the latter, how do you determine which categories to, to handicap? I think, Martin, earlier you said uh, you should uh, uh, put a weighting factor yes. on that. How, how yes. do you determine that, that, that weighting factor? I, I would think it's around finding, uh, determining which are the most important questions. So, for example, if compliance is really important, then you may give those uh, higher weighting than, than other things. But you have to look at it and say, what are the most important questions or what are the most important components of, a, of an inquiry or a contact uh, that we need to make sure are there and then giving those a higher weighting than others. I'm not sure I'd necessarily use the word handicap. Um, I think I'd probably be uh, looking to, to, uh, to, to, to use a term that promoted some questions more than others. Yeah, I think waiting is is probably the uh, the right answer there. Also, Matt, as Martin said, uh, don't forget to have not applicable. And with not applicable, you have to adjust your percentage score on both the numerator and the denominator, the top and the bottom part of the equation, so that people that with not applicable don't uh, get scored down. Uh, mm -hmm. Sharon says, I've adjusted my CSR emotional quotient, a quotient, depending on CSR character. Now everyone is piping not happy and uh, is piping, hot, sorry, hot happy and cheery. I do encourage them through comments on scorecard to remember to smile and think of caller as one of their family or friends. Uh, that, that could be dangerous. Uh, the quality of these calls meeting caller needs is more important than trying to recreate personalities. I think this is, uh, this is great. This is all about uh, uh, trying to in encourage uh, behavior behavioural mm. change. We've mm. got a question from Claire. What do, do you find is a good balance between customer and business needs on a scorecard? Perhaps, for instance, customers' impacts and processes versus compliances uh, versus agent impacting. Now, um, uh, Reg, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, on this question. What, what do you think is the good balance between customer and business needs on a scorecard? Um, for me, it, it really comes down to, you know, it's about when you're initially preparing that scorecard and you've got everything laid out in front of you that you could possibly measure, which is going to be a big list. It's really about looking at those things that are the most important to the business and to your customers as well. I think that's that's the, the best place to start when um, when you know when you when you're trying to get that balance between the two um, I think it is important to include these different elements within the scorecard but it's very easy you know to to make things very if you're in a heavily processed or heavily regulated environment to to put most of the emphasis on process which then makes it particularly challenging in my opinion for an agent to focus on uh, put more emphasis around the customer experience because the focus so heavily on the process so balance is key but again it's dependent on the nature of your organization but i would stay clear of making anything too process heavy where you can okay we've got time for a few more tips uh, Kristen says collab uh, collaboration meetings are the key within our group all managers were looking at some things a little differently uh, which were causing scores to be different we've uh, turned a lot around within the past six months you need to keep an open mind to others' opinions to be on the same page. And I certainly think, uh, as per Reg's comment, uh, advise agents in that collaboration as well. Uh, Zoe says, we do a formal session called Handling Skills and Email Etiquette as part of the induction. Later in the training program, we do a formal session on quality monitoring. If the scores are showing specific areas for improvement, uh, we do an area of the month where we send emails, hold informal sessions, provide coaching, and if necessary, do further more in-depth training. Uh, Stuart says we have a regular welcome access for agents to speak with the QA department. Quite a nice way of building buy-in. I offer a team of 10 access to me uh, uh, every day for clarification uh, or whatnot. I would say I have on average one of them contact me maybe once or twice a week just to ask for some kind of clarification uh, or occasionally to challenge a score. I believe having this option available to them is helpful mm. in being satisfied with the process. And uh, James said, uh, we classify our scores on leagues, which is in line with our business and 
uh, products, we break down into two elements, soft skill and regula uh, regulatory. Uh, so lasting impression and customer protection. Well, we're reaching the uh, top of the hour. So if you could say in one or two words in the chat room, what did you uh, like best about the uh, webinar? Uh, the uh, winning tip, let's have a look at what the winning tip is, uh, comes from uh, Joseph3. Joseph says, use a scatter graph to measure different metrics against each other and see if they have an impact on each other. If there is a strong correlation between these two key KPIs, KPIs, we might be double rewarding or double punishing of agents. So I certainly think there's uh, in lots of uh, uh, elements, um, plotting uh, one metric against another can show some quite interesting results. Uh, we've got a survey when you uh, finish the uh, webinar and uh, just like to uh, thank our speakers. Um, and uh, if you wanted to uh, catch up with uh, Reg, the conference on the 28th of uh, February uh, is a free ticket for all call center helper readers. So Martin Jukes, thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you, John T. Uh, Reg Dutton from Reg. Value Agent, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, John T. Thanks, Martin. And uh, thank you to everyone, and I hope you can join us at the same time next week. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.